Darshan Shivashankar for high impact EPI programs through streamlined EPI lifecycle and banking. He's the founder and CTO of Iterix. So, hi, Darshan. Are you able to join? Hi, Mehdi. Hello, Darshan. Nice to meet you. Are you able to share your slides with us? Uh, yes. So, I also have Rakshit, uh, who is our CEO of Iterix. Yeah. And so, Rakshit, too. Uh, oh, perfect. Yeah, the stage is yours for 20 minutes. Yeah. Thanks, Mehdi. Thank you. Great. Thank you, folks, for your time today. Uh, we wanted to share a perspective of what we have been seeing specifically in the, the banking industry over the last decade mm -hmm. in terms of how a banking industry is going through a change as well as as an opportunity for streamlining the complete API lifecycle management so that they get optimal returns in terms of getting uh, customers a delight as well as getting things into production faster as well as working with partners. Over the last uh, couple of years, it has become a, a standard norm or a vicious cycle where you obviously start seeing the expectation of the consumers keep changing and increasing and it only gets better and better. And in the same context, banking industry is not spared of this as well. As you see, the the ability for providing or doing transactions a decade ago to now is quite different. And, and the channels through which things can be done are a lot better and a lot different. And thanks to the, the neo banks and the fintechs, the, the, the up-leveling the game in terms of how customer experience can be now a lot different by bringing in things a lot quicker and faster. One of the, uh, another factor to this acceleration, uh, given the pandemic situation that everybody is going through, it has actually accelerated some of the digital transformation efforts being done in the banking industry over the last few years. And it only gets more faster from here than going backwards. And what we are seeing a lot is in the instant where customers are doing things is where they expect the services to be. They want to blur the lines between having to really switch over and do a payment in a separate screen rather than synonymously being behind the screen where things can be taken care of. They're not looking at ability to just store bank and do transactions. They're also looking at, can that be more personalized? Can it provide uh, impact analysis of a specific transaction? How will it hit the savings for, for the month or the mortgage and stuff like those? Or providing alternate channels through which they can change over their mortgage and loans from one provider to another thanks to the open banking APIs. So these are the expectation which has become table stakes. So banking industry is pushed to the uh, edge in terms of making sure they can innovate a lot quicker and faster. And to make sure that it's just not for the end customers, it's also for the partners. It's also for their own employees, the funders, the people in the support where they can really provide real-time information to make the conversation or the interaction a lot better. And what we are seeing as part of this is given the, the overall transformation effort that is being put into, it's about freeing up the resource all the way at the bottom and investing a lot more on the top because this is where the, the maximum benefits are going to really lie in terms of the innovating at the edge of uh, providing better experience, better services, ability to work with uh, fintechs and collaborate and take new levels of services for end customers. While a lot of this is being done, the key aspect in this journey that is being more and more obvious for every enterprise is majority of the overall uh, interactions or these new digital services which are at the forefront of delivering them are going to be API driven. And a lot of this will be not just built by the banks alone, but this will be a composition of services that are built in house, partnering with providers outside, and as well as trying to have a long tail of open uh, e ecosystem where developers can build and take embed the services within their own uh, applications, which they are providing to customers. So, the, the model is quite well established, so it's not a new model anymore. It's more in terms of the, the adoption of this model 
makes it an interesting shift from what it was before to what it's now. Why is this becoming so important? Because given a couple of years ago, where a lot of this was being done as a bunch of APIs to few hundreds of APIs are now getting into a shape where these are becoming thousands of APIs and it does, the API sprawl does kick in. So this is exactly what happened 15, 20 years ago when there was sprawl of the services within an enterprise and APIs are no different. So given which where everybody's investing a lot to make sure that they can harmonize, they can get better benefits from these, reduce the complexity, there is going to be huge investments in terms of making sure they can take a platform approach rather than a project-based approach. Because the difference is when you're looking at it purely from a project standpoint, it's trying to solve a specific problem statement within a group or an LOB or within a business unit, but does not help the larger scheme of being able to look at it across the bank or across an insurance industry. So this is where the sentimental change from having understood the importance of APIs, there is a fundamental shift from looking at this APIs as not just APIs, but APIs as a product as well. And thanks to the open banking regulation and everything else, this also makes things a lot interesting because what we see is effectively the playing field is being leveled, providing a lot more space for new entrants, whether it's new banks or fintechs to collaborate and work and bring things a lot faster to the hands of customers rather than having to build this over a period of time. And the it's an astronomical scale at which it's growing. Uh, some of the numbers are baffling, but as you would have seen from various other presenters within the conference, it has taken shape where fundamentally it has been established as the building blocks for any enterprise to really uh, make things happen. What we're also seeing is, as the shift is really happening, there is a, a shift towards uh, not just looking at this as solving a bespoke problem. You're also looking at this from trying to solve a bunch of other problems, which was not obvious before, where while banking industry has taken a great shape in in trying to bet and take payments to the next level. And obviously the numbers speak to itself in terms of the, the rate at which it's it's changing and, and growing. What also it means is the investments behind the scene is being put not just towards making sure they can tap on one specific area of the banking industry where they can actually benefit from, but also all the other aspects. For example, personalization, specifically during a transaction, uh, how does it help in terms of making sure it's helping save more or specifically when you're buying a mobile phone or an iPhone or anything at that specific point, what's going to be the impact or providing a bundled in uh, insurance. So this is where the expectation of providing personalized experience, where a lot of it cannot be done just by the banking industry alone. This does require collaboration, working with providers externally. So seamlessly blending them to provide uh, an experience which doesn't require them to shift context. And in the context of what they're doing, providing that experience is becoming a pure norm now. And more so, this is also contributing a lot towards where we're seeing a decline towards where the the branch utilizations and closing down of branches are becoming a, a daily news across uh, the globe now. So which means the, the investments towards the APIs are fundamentally the, the next big thing where we are seeing uh, the focus towards. While it's, it's quite obvious, we are seeing a, there's a strategic growth which is being impacted. And a lot happens to be because the ability to take full advantage of streamlining the API program is becoming more and more impact, uh, more and more important. And there are instances where, whether it was Facebook being down for some time or WhatsApp having outages or a banking application being out for some time or AWS, everything in the world is having uh, outages and challenges. And when you start trying to drill down, 
the effect of trying to move faster also means there needs to be guardrails. There needs to be some level of method to the madness to make sure that we really don't go overboard where we are not able to do a safe release at any point in time. And it gets to a point where you need to be able to leverage the full potential of the API team within an organization. And it's not having specialization with specific folks only doing certain stuff while others are really focusing on building APIs and throw over the wall and say, it's not my job anymore and it needs to be taken to production. Somebody else will really look into this. So there needs to be a harmonization because I call this as a symphony uh, within an API program. How do you make sure whether it's an API developer or an architect or an analyst or somebody from an operations team or the business team, how do they really sing a symphony that really works and gels well and it's music to the ears? For that to really happen, there needs to be a mechanism where everybody is seeing the same thing and working off the same thing. Having disjointed views and having too many different tool sets and tool stack really slows things down. While a lot of this has been brought in for solving specific problems, over a period of time, you start seeing that the investments don't really go that far when you want to scale. The, the key thing that we are seeing as four fundamental uh, roadblocks effectively translate to some of the key things that we have been hearing over and over again, which is, are we spending more time on developers focusing on innovating or are we trying to focus a lot in terms of making sure we can fix things that are actually in production do we really know what happened are the services really reliable are we make are we able to guarantee on the slas that we are really put things into production which is where you start seeing that the ability to have a really quality deliverable that comes out and at scale requires a, a larger team to be well train to be able to handle this and it's not about adding more people because adding more people is like adding fuel to the fire at that those points it's more about having people who have the knowledge the skill set who can really understand the pain points and streamline it in such a way that it's no more handcrafted scripts and custom built tools anymore because the more you spend time on trying to take bespoke tools and customize them and force fit them to solve a specific problem statement you may feel really happy that you are able to put things into production but three six months down the line somebody has to really manage them how are you really going to take care of taking those into production which is where you really start seeing that this needs to really work in such a way that it's manageable and it's something that people can really make sure that there are guardrails and safety nets in place that will make sure that things really don't go bad. And to make sure all of this really happens, given a choice, when there was a lot of survey being done, more than half the enterprise really opted in saying, if there was an ability for them to manage the whole API program end to end from inception, conceptualizing the whole thing and really putting this to a uh, test and getting this into production and deprecating them at the end of their life, they would really like to do all of this of a single platform. So when we start looking at what are high impact API programs and we start really looking at, is there an ability for enterprise to take something from conceptualizing as an idea within a business team and taking that into production in a matter of days and hours rather than weeks and months and years, because it has to be data driven which means you need to be able to do experiment. You need to be able to do controlled experiments. You need to be able to put things into people's hand and see if that's really ticking the boxes and helping move the bar higher or it's actually impacting them. So you can course correct. A lot of people really hate this term, but the fail fast is really the right approach to do stuff. But that doesn't mean that fail fast means go fast and really break everything because you need to obviously balance things out where the releases are a safe release. They're reliable releases. They've been really thought through. They really have the right ingredients to make sure that it really works. To, to really do that, there needs to be a level of upskilling the, the overall team and democratizing the approach of everybody being able to contribute to this end to end. 
rather than having specialized skill set within an organization that can really focus on after somebody really conceptualize it, let somebody else build it, and let somebody else would take care of taking it through the full life cycle and getting it into people's hand. That approach would really not work. So uh, adopting a low code, no code platform is the fundamental shift that is required to, to tame the madness and bring some level of sanity to make sure that there is an ability for business and tech to really work together because the impact is only as impactful when you can really take something from A to Z within the shortest span of time, but with a lot of safety net and make to make sure that you have the ability to roll back. You have the ability to make sure that you have audit trails, you have the tracking to make sure that what really worked, what did not really work, because that approach being data driven really helps. Second thing that becomes important in this process is having the right levels of best practices and governance at every step. And this does not mean that you need to really go uh, put so much of guardrails that it becomes a golden handcuff. You really don't want that. What it means is you need to be able to rethink the model in such a way that are there aspects of this where some of this can be automated and blended behind the scene as golden best practices and processes which people really people don't need to really know at all so in terms of if you put something into release the the simple thing that you can think about is if i'm putting an api into production and if it's a new version i'm putting from an older release the obvious thing that comes into your mind is i need to be able to make sure that what is this new api functionality providing what is the change from the previous release what's been added, what's been changed, what's going to be the impact, what's going to be the breaking things that you notify people. So if that is something which is quite obvious, then why should that be something that people need to really work on? Can that be automated by default? Can those be automatically pulled out and pushed and notified people so that this does not become like, oops, we forgot to really push this out and notify somebody and it comes back as a breaking change. And last but not the least, uh, as you look at the API lifecycle management, the, the core construct of where this really ends up uh, running is the, the gateway providers or the service mesh or the service bus. You pick and choose homegrown technologies. Are, there is a variety and it's going to be a polyglot for quite some time to come. And there is going to be a balance between one or the other, whether it's north, south, east, west the kinds of uh, technologies that you may really end up using as runtimes is, is varied and every enterprise has a choice of doing that. While that's being considered, you also want to start thinking about should a lot of your API lifecycle best practices and the tools and technologies that you use, should that be really dependent on the actual provider itself? Can those be decoupled or abstracted out in such a way that when you're conceptualizing that you want to create a new service to impact your end customer, that really doesn't have to have an impact on where it's finally going to be running. So a lot of the aspects needs to be completely abstracted out in such a way that it is not dependent on the runtime platform you're actually choosing. And this brings in the part where you see a major advantage for enterprises in cutting the cost and complexity. Because a lot of the times it's about when you are changing technologies or having two of them, you really struggle in terms of making sure, do we have the right set of visibility that you could not have before? And it's between one or the other should not have an impact, which is where I think it, it gets to a point where we really start to, really to think about if, if we need to run a high scale API program, we need to really uh, let's look at some of the core aspects to make this really worthwhile. Maybe Darshan, uh, this is where I think so it's a good time if, if you want to come and share some of the learnings from your past where you run a large scale API programs across healthcare, a telco and uh, retail and a lot of these and share some of the aspects of if you double click this lifecycle management, what are the various aspects that somebody really need to look into? Yeah, 
Thanks, Raj. That was uh, that was really in, uh, you know insightful. Uh, so, so I want to share like you know few uh, you know few uh, you know thoughts what what I've seen like working with some of the largest uh, you know banks. The one pattern that we see is uh, the enterprises want to give uh, their developers the autonomy to build and release quickly, uh, but they also want to make sure they build a stable software that integrates together. Uh, they also want to leverage the newest technologies, be it cloud uh, or be it agile methodologies, but they're all uh, but they're already struggling with the complexity and uh, conflicting goals. Uh, this and as we know, uh, they're spending too much on software, and and they know going the open source route doesn't always mean free. Uh, so so that brings us to a, a to a particular question: like, what are the key in ingredients for building and scaling a successful uh, API program? Uh, you always need to start with a strategy, and we've always seen that you know that works uh, very well uh, with any uh, API-first companies. Uh, you have to define what drives your uh, API program, uh, define the business goals that manifest into APIs which evolve, uh, and then how do you go about having an API design-first approach by applying common API design principles uh, to maintain consistency and expedite uh, platform adoption. Uh, how do you drive discovery and adoption by offering a straightforward method for finding and onboarding uh, with your API platform? Uh, how do you provide support uh, by helping teams succeed as they uh, as they uh, learn how to use your platform? Uh, how do you uh, enforce uh, or how do you drive uh, program governance becomes very uh, very critical, uh, especially for for large neo banks when when they're uh, you know when they have you know hundred plus APIs. Uh, it's very critical for them to have a good uh, program governance built in, uh, you know, uh, from the start of their API lifecycle uh, by clearly uh, defining uh, the process and uh, create APIs that that you know users can consume safely. Uh, and then, and also when they talk about the architecture, how do they combine microservices and cloud native principles uh, for a firm uh, uh, foundation? Now, having talked about the API uh, API program governance, uh, you know, let's uh, let's. Take a quick look at like how do you uh, how do you drive the platform governance, uh, you know, by avoiding internal complexities that slows down your API program by surfacing APIs from mul uh, from multiple API runtime gateways to provide a more consistent developer experience. Uh, how do you su simulate and iterate API be uh, behaviors by quickly standing up some realistic dynamic uh, mocks in seconds? Uh, you you pretty much take your uh, uh, open API contract. Uh, that you did, uh, that you carried out during the design phase, and then you actually like iterate uh, uh, by by creating uh, dynamic mocks or virtualization. Uh, how do you reduce the outages? Uh, you know, have, uh, as we have seen with numerous times, uh, most of the uh, outages are due to the uh, misconfigurations in the config management. Uh, we always uh, have seen that uh, you know uh, enterprises adopting a version controlled uh, config management has always helped them. Uh, so we all know uh, enterprises wants to uh, quickly build and release their uh, API products, uh, but they want to ensure that they do that uh, by having a good contract-driven uh, API governance. So what it means is you pretty much take your uh, your design uh, assets and then you quickly build uh, your your contract-driven test cases and then you integrate it with your with your CI/CD to ensure that there's a predictable uh, release model and continuous delivery. Um, we all know, uh, you know, uh, you know, API consumers or API partners are the key aspects of any API program. Uh, so, how do you simplify the API adoption by enhancing the developer experience uh, by providing API resources to internal partner and third-party developers for for faster collaboration and API consumption? Uh, how do you increase developer productivity by creating auto-generated interactive API documentations and SDKs? Uh, which allows team to succeed as they learn, make calls, and view sample responses from each endpoint. Uh, how do they go about building the real-time API monitoring, which ensures that there's a, there's uptime always for for your APIs that you're actually deploying? Um, so, having said this, what we have seen the uh, what we have seen, uh, Rakshit, there's, there's a fundamental shift towards API centricity and self-service, which ensures enterprises get uh, you know they can drive their business strategy. With a broad overview of cross-company APIs, causing stability and ensuring usability, taking them faster to the market while really uh, while releasing stable software and then helping them to monetize their APIs and their assets. Great, Darshan. Thanks for that insight. That's really helpful, and and I really hope like with the with the three key aspects, we should be able to uh, get 
a high scale API programs down a lot quicker and faster. Thanks. Thank you, Great. folks. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. And I think it's at the perfect uh, timing. <laughs> uh, the perfect timing as we have a panel afterwards. I would, uh, I would not, um, I don't want to uh, force speakers to be uh, to be delayed, but thank you very much. It was a great uh, wide vision about the, the full, let's say, journey <laughs> about, uh, about the API program and API strategy. Uh, don't hesitate to share in the link where we can know more about, uh, you know, uh, about uh, uh, this journey or about the feedbacks you gathered, uh, yes, with the community. Yep, yeah. thanks, Mehdi. Yeah, thank thanks for the good. opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it was really compelling. I've seen a lot of slide deck about API programs. Uh, this one was really east, west, south, north, like <laughs> covering a lot of aspects. Thank you very much, Darshan, and thank yeah. you, Rakshit. Thanks, Mehdi. Thank you. Too.